Prosecutors will try to prove James Martin fatally shot Alan Powell last May in a Montgomery subdivision. Assistant District Attorney Ellen Brooks said in opening arguments that Powell, a car salesman, was test driving an auto when he was killed and then robbed. Attorneys first questioned the family Martin and his half-brother Edward Monteith lived with at the time. After that, the owner of a deer rifle that may have been used in the crime testified that he had had a rifle stolen from his home just a month before Powell was killed. Danny Davis did positively identify the rifle and scope that prosecutors presented to him. Next, a man who saw Martin's car in his neighborhood took the stand. John Holloway said he saw two men get out of the car, but could not positively say if Martin was one of them. The body of Alan Powell was found in Holloway's neighborhood later that evening. Circuit Judge Mark Kennedy has sequestered the jury to keep them from reading or seeing news accounts of the trial. Because of the large number of witnesses expected to be called, the trial could last all week. Andrew Findlay, WSFA News 12, Montgomery. says their program Mr. Speaker now is not the time to start denying veterans who are in the position to buy a home for the first time in six years or to tell them that they can't refinance their loan at ten and a half percent when their original loan has a much higher interest rate no allowing veterans to refinance their loans at lower rates are better risk loans and will serve to reduce the foreclosure rate in the future. Are we going to tell veterans who want to use their entitlement for the first time because of the CBA, CBO and OMB reports may have gotten carried away? We are thinking about how to best address this problem in some cases. Well, I'm delighted there was as little bloodshed as it was involved in, in this so-called revolution and that uh, civil unrest was at a minimum. I'm very hopeful that this new government will see to it that uh, democratic principles are involved in the government and that uh, they will turn out to be pro-American in their attitude. Dan has been very complimentary, and I want to return the compliment. I thank. Uh, there are a lot of questions that confront the average office holder that's in the gray area. And they want to be moved out of the gray area. They want to know what they're doing is either legal or illegal. And if it's illegal, they don't want to do it. But they want someone to tell them that standards of conduct for those who serve in public office. In public office, what amazed me was that the gentleman who was talking to me was an attorney for those who serve in public office. Now with that bit of and 40 members of the Alabama House and Senate, that's a ratio of, of about uh, what, uh, three and a half, four lobbyists to each legislator. Uh, our research says that there's only one state that has a higher ratio, and that's Texas. But I believe if we work at it and really get <laughs> down there, uh, our the Drug Barons Enforcement Act of 1986 would do that by making the penalty so stiff that those people who would import a uh, million dollars or more of hard drugs uh, would think twice about uh, using Alabama as a conduit. And at the same time to help defray the cost of, uh, of, the, of the penal system. State, uh, county jails, to, to bring them up to federal standards. All <laughs> Jack.
Explaining the farmer's plight to the general public is like explaining the Bible to someone who's never heard of it. So says 66-year-old John Carter, who's farmed Alabama soil since he was 16. Unless we have some prices, Lisa, we'll all be gone by next year. These farmers say because FHA lent too many people too much money, the nation now faces a surplus of farmers and all are being hurt. I think it's going to weed out all the good farmers and bad farmers, and it's just a matter of time. Borrowing isn't a new practice for farmers. John Carter's borrowed each of the 50 years he's farmed. The problem is now farmers aren't making enough profit to pay off their loans. FHA knows that, and so do bankers. Well, they say the banker changed hands and the new man wasn't going to make any agricultural loans. So I've been looking for another bank for about a month. What's, how is that going to affect you? If I don't find a bank, I won't be farming. They're talking about people getting letters. You're not getting a letter, but you can't get financial. So you're, you're gone anyway. These farmers say the federal government encouraged too many people to become farmers and then ruined the marketplace. Importing more goods than, than we can export and, uh, and uh, taking our technology to different countries and, and they're selling us out the way I see it. The sad truth is food prices in Alabama fell by 4.1% this month. So neither consumers nor politicians will save these small farmers. And in the end, farmers say consumers will pay the price. If a corporation wanted to buy my farm, it's for sale. This is Lisa Walsh, WSFA News 12 in Macon County. If anyone can get these bills through, can anyone that had the influence and had the time when, when it's going to be very difficult to do? I would, I would imagine leading somebody. On any casual observer, would know a program. Tell your representative. What I'm saying, we're spending as much to care for the prisoners in state institutions as we are caring for the elderly, the children, and the handicapped in this state. And our priorities are wrong, and we need to change those priorities as soon as we can. But that's exactly what we're going to have to do. And it may mean, uh, in terms of uh, the political procedure, push uh, and, and support a new program, uh, uh, not a new program. Hit Radio Y102, this is Cat Collins. Don't forget Friday morning, that very special announcement shortly after. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Alabama Department of Environmental Management proposed to issue a permit to General Electric Company located in Burkeville, Alabama, for the construction and operation of a hazardous waste storage facility. Information regarding this permit may be reviewed at the Alabama Department of Environmental Management Office, Land Division, 1751 Federal Drive, Montgomery, Alabama, 36130, or by writing the EPA in Atlanta, Georgia. The House Judiciary Committee approved two separate bills designed to save the State Ethics Commission. The measures are sponsored by Representative Charles Martin of Decatur and George Perdue of Birmingham. Martin's bill, which has 75 co-sponsors in the House, would establish a minimum prison term of two years in prison or a minimum fine of $2,000 or both for felony violations. Failure to disclose would be a misdemeanor. Purdue's measure would set the minimum at 30 days in prison and a $100 fine. Both measures now go to the House floor for review. 30 Mobile area residents attended a public hearing today seeking committee approval of a bill that would eliminate long-distance calls within the county. Representative Taylor Harper of Grand Bay co-sponsored the legislation. Right now you have a lot of counties, the majority of the counties in the state, to call from one end of the county to the other, call in the county seat. It's a town to town, it's long distance charges. And, and I don't think that's fair, and a lot of us in the legislature don't think it's fair. The bill was defeated by the House Utilities and Transportation Committee on a vote of 10 to 1. Lawmakers say the matter should be addressed by the Public Service Commission. Shed Johnson, WSFA News 12, at the Alabama State House.
to maintain commitments that are not necessarily commitments that are best for this state. $138.5 million in soybeans. So I don't know whether it's going to come through the front door or through maybe one of the side doors we have here. Cut back. We're not selling those products in that free market. Who's getting that business and why are they getting that business rather than our own farmers? Andrew Finley of our staff is standing by. He's covering the trial. He's live at the Montgomery County Courthouse. Andy, what's happened so far today? Bob, Kathy Ellison, the woman in the car with Alan Powell when he was killed, testified this morning. She told jurors that she had just switched places with the car salesman when two strangers approached the car in Montgomery's Timberlane subdivision. She testified that one of the two went to the front side of the car. She said he had a rifle, which he slowly drew up and pointed at Powell, firing it into his chest. However, she cannot positively identify James Martin as the man who shot Powell, saying she was more concerned with where the rifle was pointing at the time. But the Timberlane resident, Ms. Ellison, reported the incident to was able to identify Martin as being in the neighborhood shortly before the shooting. James Martin's half-brother, Edward Monteith, took the stand after lunch. Without the jury present, Monteith is also charged with capital murder in the case and is awaiting trial. Prosecutors were unable to get virtually any testimony out of Monteith, though, with him invoking his Fifth Amendment right not to testify against himself. Next, a state ballistics expert positively linked the bullet that killed Powell as having been fired from the rifle that has been entered as testimony. That rifle has not been linked to, uh, to uh, James Martin. However, the scope that was on it when it was stolen has. And a former inmate of Martin's testified that Martin told him that he, in fact, killed Alan Powell. He was to, or rather, he also testified that Martin's half-brother was to dump the rifle in the Alabama River and that he was to have their car crushed. Bob? Andrew, uh, the testimony is continuing into tonight, is that correct? That is correct, Bob. They've stopped right now and they expect to resume tonight at 7.30 and the reports we've been given say they may go as late as 10.30 this night with this trial. Thanks a lot. Andrew Finley live at the Montgomery County Courthouse with coverage of the James Martin murder trial. Meanwhile, police... In Especially, I want to win the LSU because we are, I haven't won down there. LSU and Kentucky, the only two places I haven't won. I'm going to go in there fired up and ready to play. And I'm going to have the rest of the guys ready to go. One time we had Watley. I think we won a game down there outside of that. We hadn't won many times in Florida. But uh, I can say this about this team, regardless of what happens, we've got five road victors in the conference, and we've got a winning road record. And uh, they can't take that away from us for sure. And we got 19 wins, and that's as many as we had going into the tournament last year with two games left. Oh, until Paul Foster delivered a game winner for Auburn in the last inning. Mark Thornhill is out there in Auburn to fill us in on the details. Mark? You were right about it being a packed house here at Plainsman Park. Feel a great opening day crowd for the Tigers. Lots of Major League scouts on hand. Of course, a lot of attention being focused on Auburn center fielder Bo Jackson. But uh, certainly the guy who stole the show was the other half of Auburn's football-baseball connection. Little Trey Gaines flexed his muscles today, ripping two solo home runs. This one here in the bottom of the seventh. He had one in the bottom of the first, as well as a triple. The little man showed some power today. Uh, you know, I've hit home runs before, but never two in a game. And, uh, you know, certainly not college. So, uh, I don't know. Just something was happening today. That's about it. Bo Jackson, who, of course, uh, many pro scouts were on hand to watch today, was uh, one for four. He struck out three times, had some problems making contact, but he did come up with his RBI double in the bottom of the fifth. First day, it was, well, it was like I expected. Was be, because once you get started, the first of the season, things come hard. But once the season gets started, you get into the swing of things. As you can see, I wasn't into the swing of things today, but I'm looking forward to a bigger and better season. 
And it was Paul Foster who came up with a game-winning hit. But the score tied at four apiece in the bottom of the ninth. Foster drove in who else but that man again, Trey Gaines, with a game-winning run. I was really kind of surprised that they were going to throw to me and everything, but, you know, I, I figured that he was going to throw a curveball, so I, that's what I was looking for when I went up. And, you know, I just lucky to get a hit. So uh, with that, Auburn uh, winning it, as you mentioned, by a score of 5-4. to four. With us now, Auburn head coach Hal Baird. Coach, a great way to start off the 86 season, but I guess you hope they all don't come down to the wire like this, right? Yeah, that was really a nail-biter. I was hoping it was going to be a little easy, but uh, the kids played hard and played well, and we, we won the game. That's the most important thing. And I think overall, as a first game, it was pretty well done. What about this man, Trey Gaines? What have you been feeding this guy? I ask him the same thing. Trey really has, has really had a great preseason, and... He's so much further ahead now than where he was last year. I'm not entirely surprised, but it's kind of interesting. We were telling him we wanted to get on top of the ball a little bit and use his great speed, but uh, instead he hits a couple balls out. But I'm really happy for him. It's a good start for him. If you had to grade this team like a test, what do they get for day one? <laughs> I'd have to say maybe a C plus. We, uh, we hope to get much better. We're going to have to get much better to compete in the SEC. But, you know, I think that with... Uh, with some of the young kids getting a chance to play and, and using three pitchers, uh, overall it was uh, you know, acceptable, but not where we need to be to compete in the SEC. All right. Thank you, Coach Baird. Yeah. Great beginning for the 86th season for the Auburn Tigers. The guy wearing the biggest smile again, little Trey Gaines. He stole the show. Phil? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Big day sounds like from the Plains. Well, we're in the last week. Steve with the city and county. Selma, 1965. By way of television, the world watched the violent reaction of state officials to the now famous Selma to Montgomery March. That same coverage of the bloody confrontations became a major factor in the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Until that landmark piece of legislation became law, nationwide, blacks were denied even the basic rights afforded by the Constitution, and Alabama was no exception, especially in the area of political clout. But now, 20 years later, all that has changed. Alabama has 802 black elected officials. We have more black state legislators, mayors, sheriffs, and commissioners than any other state in the union. That outstanding record of electing blacks to state and local offices is a direct result of the Voting Rights Act and an ongoing campaign to register blacks to vote. In fact, more than 80% of all eligible blacks are registered to vote in Alabama. I think in 1965, there was more concern for the backlash because there were so few black voters. But now, with the number of black voters in the state, say, being uh, over 500,000, um, it's almost impossible, say, in statewide races for any candidate, no matter what his racial views may be, to simply ignore the black vote with impunity. Because Tuskegee Mayor Johnny yeah, Ford says so. each decade yeah. since the Voting Rights Act Oscar of 1965 Adams, has seen significant advances by blacks in many areas. It's been a sense of revolution for us in the 40s and the 50s, education, into the 60s, the political and the civil rights struggle, the 70s, the political proliferation of our people, and now the 80s is an economic struggle. We've made tremendous progress, but obviously not as much progress as we should make or, or that we're going to make. The most recent figures available from the Joint Center for Political Studies shows the number of black elected officials increased by 85% in 1984, another signal that black power in the political arena is continuing to grow. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12.
Over the last two decades, with the expansion of black political power, blacks have found new opportunities in business and other areas. But some educators and some experts say those opportunities are minimal. Several savings and loan institutions are controlled by minorities, but there is only one black bank in the state located in Mobile. Jerome Harris is vice president and group manager of the Fairview Avenue First Alabama Bank branch. Well, of course, if you use the 1965 Voting Rights Act as a point of reference, certainly you, you would have to say that we have achieved and we have accomplished quite a bit in that time. However, when you look at the area of money management or money growth in the black community, the progress that we've made has been very much less than satisfactory. Uh, that's probably because uh, a lack of knowledge in money management. Uh, when we achieved or obtained the ability to increase our earning power in terms of more affluence, in terms of higher paying jobs, uh, we were not necessarily prepared to know how to handle that. And that trend has only begun to change in recent years. Bankers and economic experts we talk to say until blacks manufacture more goods and reverse the role of the consumer to supplier, then and only then will Alabama's blacks have what is considered to be any significant economic clout. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12. The black church provided the place to meet to plan the next assault on laws that deprived blacks of voting, employment, and other civil rights. It was the place most frequently targeted by Klan members and others who opposed first-class citizenship for minorities. The preacher was most often the most powerful political leader in the community, but all that changed after the national voting legislation was passed in 1965. Reverend Leroy Fountain is the minister at Montgomery South Lawn Baptist Church. Reverend Fountain says the voting rights laws had great impact on the black church's political power. The power of the black church is significant now as it has always been. Um, to be part of that is where does the black minister stand in terms of what this power is, is he stands somewhere near the periphery today because there is a professional politician in the community today and he is not necessarily the preacher as he has been in the past. Um, that power base is called upon in times of election, in times of uh, citywide crisis and national crisis, and not necessarily in times of uh, uh, tranquility and peace in the community. And even though the black elected official has replaced the black church's role in the political life of Alabama's blacks, most candidates still get up early Sunday and look for the largest black congregation they can find to speak to and ask for votes. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12. Twenty years ago, there were few blacks practicing law in this state. Those who did had to attend law school in other states, and bar exams were purposely made difficult for them. Now, numerous black firms operate in Alabama, and the impact of those practices is heavily felt in the criminal justice system and in civil law practices. Montgomery Circuit Court Judge Charles Price says there's real influence enjoyed by blacks on the bench and in other aspects of the state's legal system. We have reached a point uh, that we do have some influence, and I have to say that because of the number of uh, black judges that we do have now. Uh, we have uh, four black circuit judges, one in Mobile, two in Birmingham, and of course I sit here in Montgomery County. And then we have approximately three to four district judges. And we also have Justice Oscar Adams on the Alabama Supreme Court, and, and also throughout the uh, state we have several blacks who are working uh, as deputy district attorneys throughout the state. And I think that's good. And I think because of the involvement of, uh, of the black judges, of course, and then uh, black prosecutors, et cetera, and other support personnel in the district attorney's office and in the criminal justice system, that gives us quite a bit of a, a power, at least, uh, uh, to, to, to influence the outcome of, of, of decisions that affect uh, not only black people, but the criminal justice system as a whole. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12. Thank you.
It's obvious that some what progress has been made by blacks. 800 or more are in elective offices in the state, and many hold other important posts in the public and private sector. But according to Dr. William Lawson, chairman of ASU's History and Sociology Department, most blacks haven't enjoyed any of those advantages. Well, again, as, as a group as a whole, we don't have very much to be proud about. In 1960, uh, we were earning some 55% of, of white income. In other words, for each dollar that a white person earned in 1960, we earned only 55 cents. In 1980, uh, we are only earning 56 cents of every dollar that a white person uh, earns. So you can see there has been little or no progress in terms of the uh, narrowing the gap in income of blacks and whites. And of course, poverty statistics uh, are, are not looking good. As a matter of fact, there has been some increase uh, since the 1960s, particularly the mid-1960s. Uh, still about 34 percent of our people are in poverty as defined by uh, the U.S. Uh, government uh, a poverty definition. So 20 years after the Voting Rights Act was passed, blacks control many political offices and are moving into more important positions in private industry. But the consensus is that the next and perhaps the most important move should be in the economic arena. Because until blacks own businesses that can and will employ residents of their community, putting most of the money blacks spend back into that community, the true realization of black power may still be just a daydream. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12, reporting. And the language is of concern to us because the language that is in the bill would prevent our use of that 3.1 million uh, in anything other than production agriculture, which would mean that our FNET programs, expanded uh, food and nutrition program, our 4-H programs, and our home economics programs uh, would not qualify for even the funds that are available. I was really kind of surprised that they were going to throw it to me and everything, but 
you know, I, I figured that he was going to throw a curveball, so I, that's what I was looking for when I went up. And, you know, I just lucky to get a hit. Hey, somebody forgot to tell you you're not supposed to hit home runs. I don't know. I'm just surprised anybody else, you know. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, have you ever done this before? No. Uh, you know, I've hit home runs before, but never two in a game. And, uh, you know, certainly not college. So, uh, I don't know. Just something was happening today. is accused of killing Montgomery car salesman Alan Powell last spring. Reporter Andrew Finley is standing by at the Montgomery County Courthouse. Andrew? Lynn, as you know, it's been a day filled with testimony. Kathy Ellison, the woman in the car with Alan Powell when he was shot to death, testified this morning. However, she was unable to positively identify James Martin as the man who fatally shot Powell. A resident of the neighborhood where Powell was slain testified he'd seen Martin in Timberlane subdivision shortly before the shooting. And a state ballistics expert linked the deer rifle in evidence as having fired the bullet that caused Powell's death. What the state must do now is tie the rifle used to kill Powell to Martin. A scope on the rifle when it was stolen has been linked to Martin, but a state fingerprint expert, the last witness to testify tonight, could not find Martin's fingerprints on the rifle that was used to kill Alan Powell. Lynn? Well, Andrew, what strategy, strategy rather, is the defense planning to, to take in light of this testimony today? Lynn, I would say that the uh, defense is trying to find chinks in the state's armor. They are trying to throw out to jurors, has the state proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt, since there are questions as to whether or not uh, Kathy Ellison actually saw James Powell, uh, or I should say, James Martin pull the trigger. And uh, James Martin himself did not testify at any point in this trial. And uh, one of the last points we heard when we left the trial, which is still going on, the uh, defense right now is making its closing arguments at this moment, is that they are asking jurors whether or not this crime merits the electric chair. All right. Thank you a lot, Andrew. Reporter Andrew Finley reporting live from the Montgomery County Courthouse. The farm crisis is hitting home for more than a thousand Alabama farmers this week. The Farmers Home Administration. But this bill has now uh, gotten into the uh, political arena and has been amended and uh, various other changes made to it. And I'm concerned now that if there is any bill passed that it won't uh, be very effective. It matters. You know, that's what... Uh, Bob Hope and uh, painting that will go on the parachute. Program together. If, um, as I call the name, personnel and safety director of West Point's Langdale Mill in the valley, ATMI has, ATMA has uh, bought the, a sign that's cost about $200. This year, the sign was... So I, I think the positive approach uh, to be, uh, that'd be my recommendation that we work it out uh, with a less frosty. Uh, uh, $9? To $300, which now. What do you recommend? Well, like, like, like we uh, outlined here, uh, all of these are uh, very important points that were brought out for the economic development. 
The board's original idea was to waive out-of-state tuition fees for non-Alabama students who live within a 50-mile radius of a two-year state-supported institution. But some junior college presidents complained that proposal was unfair to all post-secondary schools in the state, in particular those that don't border neighboring states. And other junior college presidents would only accept the waiver resolution if other states would reciprocate, saying that reciprocity is good for competition. The board finally agreed and will survey Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Florida to see if they'll support the plan. Figures show junior and technical colleges in Alabama that border 50 miles of adjacent states would lose about $129,000 this winter quarter from the 860 out-of-state students. The board hopes the proposal will attract more non-Alabama students to make up the loss. It's not known when the waiver plan will become effective. Kim Davis, WSFA News 12 at the State Board of Education. Police say the 42-year-old McEwen's arrest came after he invited two vice officers to his home after stopping them behind the post office in downtown Montgomery late Tuesday night. Mr. McEwen allegedly approached two undercover vice officers in the downtown area and was invited to his house uh, at, on Cloverdale Road. Uh, once at the house, an uh, offer for illicit sex was made to the officers. At that time, they uh, affected the arrest. For a lot of them. McEwen's attorney, Lewis Hickman, says his client is not guilty, and that'll be proven in court March 10th when McEwen faces trial on the charge. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12. Those research numbers is very important, and of course, this last year is a significant sources on undergraduate teaching and basic support of priority. The attraction of and the support of studying for advanced degrees. Just before we move these charts, you can see here engineering this past year has grown substantially. I would like now to call on presidents of our campuses for specific model building for activities that can be transferred. Potential exist, Governor, for many, many more in years ahead. Uh, what these companies are... a small one, but I'm not sure you can see this. One of the governor's most loyal floor leaders, Eufaula Democrat Jimmy Clark, made an emotional appeal to his colleagues not to give in to what he called political chicanery after the governor tried to delay House committee work on the much-debated tort reform package. Clark, the chairman of the House Rules Committee, urged the membership to stand tall. I hope that you will not let political chicanery stop this issue from being addressed in this legislature. Clark's speech brought lawmakers to their feet with cheers and applause. Following a meeting with the governor, the so-called tort reform package will be in line for a public hearing Wednesday, while Wallace's tax package will be reviewed in committee on Tuesday. In the Alabama Senate, a week-long filibuster by four Republicans came to an end after more than 49 hours. The Senate passed a resolution that will allow it to consider the Buy American bill. The vote came after Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley refused to recognize any additional stalling tactics. Senators are discussing several possible changes in the bill. The bill, if passed, would require city, county, and state agencies to buy American-made products, even if they are more expensive than foreign-made goods. Chet Johnson, WSFA News 12, the Alabama State House. And sometimes in our experiences, we do not know, understand why. I believe that the road. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, I'm not prepared to will I. The Talladega Police Department investigators are looking for a white male, approximately 33 years of age, identified to us as a one Daniel Spence. Mr. Spence was known to be an acquaintance of both adult female victims in this case and has not been seen in Talladega since late Wednesday afternoon, February the 19th. Are you closer now to finding the killer than you were, say, a couple days ago? I won't discuss that. Brian, we don't know at this time, and what we do know, we're not at liberty to discuss with you about the particulars of the case. Uh, 
As I indicated, sir, we don't feel like information leads us to believe that he's out of the state at this time. We won't guarantee that, but we feel like that information. Monday of this week, police found 24-year-old Sherry Weathers and her two preschool sons dead in their apartment. Just a couple of hundred feet away, the body of her friend, Linda Jarman, age 33, was also found. Police say two of the victims were strangled, but they have made no arrest in the case. But today, Talladega's police chief told reporters his department is searching for two primary suspects. Mike Hamlin says other law enforcement agencies are looking for a 33-year-old white male. Hamlin says David Spence was last seen driving Jarman's 1973 Buick Century. Mr. Spence was known to be an acquaintance of both adult female victims in this case and has not been seen in Talladega since late Wednesday afternoon, February the 19th. Hamlin says police are also searching for a white female. He says 32-year-old Linda Faye Odom was also last seen February 19th. Both Sherry Weathers and Linda Jarman were deaf. Jarman worked and Weathers was a student at the state's institution for the deaf. Today, the school held a memorial service on their behalf. I believe that the rose is a precious flower. And this signifies Linda and Sherry and her two sons. Many of those attending today's memorial service were instructors and close personal friends to Sherry and Linda's here at the Alabama School for the Deaf and Blind. She was a friend. Um, she was very, very helpful. And to a, to a hearing person new in the community, that was, that was truly a, a blessing. Sherry came to the trade school for a short time back in December. She was a very good student, very motivated eager to learn. Sandra Mason was a roommate of Sherry's for three years and considered her a close friend. Right now it's kind of difficult for me to explain how it feels to be losing a good friend like her because there's a lot of deaf people that try to dig it. They know her and they just don't see how anyone can hurt her like that. Police are hoping autopsy reports will provide more evidence in the case. Hamlin says he should have those results tomorrow. Scott Edcock, WSFA News 12 in Talladega. A proposal to rezone 400 plus acres for high density in terms of putting apartments there. We feel like this is a major consideration on our side of town, and we need to have some input into that. We have not had any input into that. So it was, it was a logical step to select land that we felt like would have the least opposition, and I think the majority opposition is because of the crowding of the Brubaker School. because of the impact that we're starting to think about the magnitude of building a city on 248. It's a touchy situation, a part of the city growing by leaps and bounds with what parents feel are the best quality schools in the city nearby for their children to attend. They're afraid the rezoning will result in the construction of thousands of apartments on just 240 acres of land and cause overcrowding in their schools. The homeowners think they should have been consulted before any such plan unfolded. Also, we are very concerned about the safety factors. We feel like that to put that many children close to the Troy Highway, uh, that many people opening out on Bell Road as it exists now, we feel like that creates a safety problem for our children and for our citizens. It is only the area of the land where if the apartments are developed, it'll be the 10 to 12 years from now before we get to the Carriage Hills area. So it was, it was a logical step 
to select land that we felt like would have the least opposition, and I think the majority opposition is because of the crowding the Brubaker School, which is a city problem, a city planning problem on the school board side as to where these children will go to school in the future. Uh, we can't very well have a moratorium on growth on the east side just because we don't have places for children to go to school. We'll have to wait until tomorrow to find out what the Planning Commission recommends, but the ultimate decision on whether the land is rezoned to accommodate apartments is in the hands of the City Council. This is Gina Gregory, WSFA News 12 at City Hall. Our third inductee tonight, unfortunately, cannot be here, but his granddaughter, Ms. Holly Huxford, is going to accept. As a board, make a decision on which ones are going to be inducted. It gets pretty tough, but I think this year we had three very different. Auburn University and Auburn Agriculture. And this is uh, due to two things, I think. One is the fact that, that our magazine is headquartered here in the state of Alabama. And the second reason is that that our uh, chief executive officer, Emory Cunningham, is an ag graduate of Auburn who was honored by selection and the presentation of a, of a special award given by you know, of a Your loss would result in the total loss of our secondary program. I don't think we will be able to operate a program at the secondary level if we had this kind of cut. I have one tutor. That she will provide the depth and breadth of experiences that students need to compete in modern society. Mrs. Falcon. image of the do-gooder TV lawyer whose advocacy, as I always said, hurts him. Nevertheless, a common dilemma confronting an attorney appointed to represent I'm supposed to be appointed. If the case is in the plaintiff, it's certain to prevail or win, but the standard is cause a mistrial. And if there's one person who dislikes mistrials more than lawyers, it's judges. As the saying goes sometimes, the trial judges, if you're going to reverse me, reverse and render, but don't reverse and remand. You don't want to score that last. Found guilty. Standing by, by now live at the Montgomery County Courthouse is reporter Dean Argo. Dean? Well, Lynn, the jury got the case this afternoon about 3 o'clock after a lengthy charge. The jury deliberated just less than two hours before finding James Lewis Martin guilty of the capital murder of Alan Powell. Now, because Martin has been found guilty of capital murder, they will need a second phase of this trial or a penalty phase, and that means that is now necessary. Now, because the defense is expected to call more than about 10 character witnesses during the penalty phase, Judge Mark Kennedy has scheduled that trial to begin at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, here with us now live is Assistant District Attorney Ellen Brooks. Now, Ellen, you had to prosecute this case. It took about two weeks. We finally got into the trial this week. How do you feel about it, and what do you think uh, was the swaying evidence in this case? Certainly, I think we'd have to say that we are relieved that the truth has come out and the jury has returned a verdict of guilty as charged. The relief is primarily for the victim's family. Mrs. Betsy Powell and her relatives, I know, have been up the emotional roller coaster for the last two weeks. Finally, after lengthy and full investigation by our Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, the truth is out. We'll be ready tomorrow. We believe our evidence will be compelling, and we're looking forward to resuming court. Now, because the penalty phase is in the morning, what is the district attorney's office looking for out of that penalty hearing, and how do you think it will go? We will be presenting evidence that will show the aggravating circumstances, James Martin's prior record, the fact that he'd only been released from prison a week before this tragic event occurred. And we'll ask the jury to return a verdict of uh, recommending the death penalty in the case. 
Okay, thank you, Ellen. Now, because it is a capital murder case, the jury will have either death in the electric chair or life in prison without parole. They will recommend that to Judge Kennedy. He will have the final say. But again, Lynn, James Lewis Martin has been found guilty of capital murder, and he will have the penalty phase of this trial tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in Judge Kennedy's courtroom. All right. Thank you a lot, Dean. The Alabama School for the Deaf and Blind held a... It took the five-man, seven-woman jury less than two hours to find James Lewis Martin guilty of murdering Alan Powell last May. Martin showed little emotion as Circuit Judge Mark Kennedy announced the jury verdict. In fact, the jury came back in an hour and 45 minutes. I think it sent a message to James Martin and the other people out there who are committing crimes. We are very pleased with the outcome and we'll be ready in the morning to begin the sentencing phase. Brooks says the evidence was overwhelming. A Timberlane Estates resident positively identified Martin as being in the area the night Powell was shot to death. Two confessions by Martin, one to a sheriff's investigator, the other to a former cellmate, were introduced as evidence. The capital murder conviction carries two sentences, either death in the electric chair or life in prison without parole. We believe that under the law and the evidence that Mr. Martin should receive the death penalty in this case because of his criminal history and the nature of this offense. The jury will convene in the morning at 9 o'clock and will make a penalty recommendation to Judge Kennedy, but Kennedy will ultimately decide Martin's sentence. The other suspect in this case, Martin's half-brother, Edward Monteith, is scheduled to be tried for capital murder as soon as Judge Kennedy can find an appropriate date. Dean Argo, WSFA News 12 at the Montgomery County Courthouse. will follow the Carver-Auburn game. Mark Thornhill has been keeping up with the 2A, 3A classes at the Auburn Coliseum that began this morning. Let's check in now with Mark for those results. Mark. Well, Phil, the uh, first round of the uh, Class 2A competition uh, is now in the books. It is complete. Uh, eight teams began the day. Now only four remain at this point. We'll get to the scoreboard uh, and uh, show you how the uh, Class 2A action went this afternoon. Uh, at uh, 9 o'clock this morning, Talladega County defeated White Plains 60 to 53. The next ball game up, DAR defeated Zion Chapel. Zion Chapel from our area. Uh, our area. DAR winning that one 60 to 44. So DAR advances to face Talladega County in the uh, 2A semifinals tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. Now, uh, Red Level, meanwhile, nipped Millport later today, 41 to 39. So uh, the uh, Red Level Tigers advanced to play Hazelwood. Hazelwood knocked off Winterboro, as you see, 59 to 56. In uh, Class 3A first round action, only one game is in the books, and that game uh, saw Montevallo defeat Winfield 84 to 73 highlights from that ball game first half Montevallo goes to uh, Tommy Bivens Bivens great prospect he uh, hits turnaround jumper Winfield gets right back down the court uh, Bartley wires with the bucket there as you see back and forth action continuous action in fact these guys uh, weren't nervous a bit uh, Montevallo's Slade Blackwell drives and puts it in then uh, number 54 for Winfield James Simmons is going to come back and get the bucket all this first half action uh, Montevallo led 40 to 32 at the end of the half, but uh, Montevallo put it away. Second half, a slam dunk there from Tommy Bivens. And again, Montevallo went on to uh, win that ball game, the final 84 to 73. Now, Montevallo advances to play the winner of the Headland Tanner ball game. That ball game is in progress right now. They've just begun. We'll hang around and get some highlights uh, from that contest for you at 10. Later tonight, R.C. Hatch will play Holly Pond. Aniana will tanger with the uh, East Limestone in other. Uh, uh, action uh, here from Auburn. Uh, Class Mark. 1A competition scheduled to get underway tomorrow morning. Phil? Mark, I understand that Pierre Good, the highly sought after football prospect, had quite a game in the Hazelwood victory. He sure did. 17 points, the uh, final seven for Hazelwood. He, he goes by the name Ethan. He was listed as Ethan, so he, I guess he's traveling incognito, but 17 points, seven uh, big ones there at the uh, last of the ball game. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right. Mark, we'll be keeping up with all the action uh, as we uh, fill you in on it later tonight.
I, I don't even understand why the current candidates for the office of governor, the highest office in the state, that none of them, to my recollection, election, have at this point come out in favor of strengthening the ethics law. It's a ready-made issue. It won't hurt anybody. I think if one or all of the candidates stood up and said that out loud, they would be soundly applauded. That kind of thing. And we're going we're gonna to try to meet force with force. This is when the enemy has shown us that they exert the most strength, and that's exactly The green line indicates when the first shift patrol will come on. They will come on at 6 a.m. in the morning and work till 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The yellow line indicates the second shift patrol, which will come on at 4 p.m. and work till 2 a.m. in the morning. The third shift patrol, which usually comes on at 10.30 at night, will now advance their time by a couple hours and come on at 8 p.m. at night and work till 6 a.m. in the morning. And this blue line indicates the time period in which you will receive the double coverage. There's some uh, problems that we are anticipating. We do anticipate uh, a massive influx of... Uh, I would hope that we see no substantial change, and I don't anticipate any substantial change in the near future. Uh, Mrs. Aquino realizes uh, that we played a critical part in bringing about a peaceful, bloodless, relatively bloodless transition, that she wouldn't be in the chair that she occupies today if it hadn't been for the assistance uh, of the United States. Two of the four bathrooms which serve the 800 students at this elementary school are out of order. Parents had complained about the conditions and workers were fixing the bathrooms. But yesterday yeah. afternoon, a pipe burst and that set back the restoration and infuriated the parents. The plumbing should have been checked out before the man attempted to put that towel and uh, put in masonry on the wall because if the pipe, if the plumbing is the problem, the water is going to ruin the work that he's already done. But Superintendent Kozman says the problem will be taken care of. And we'll be working on them and complete them by Monday of next week. Not only are parents concerned about problems inside the school, they also want the eroded grounds outside the school landscaped. Uh, just yesterday and today I've been in contact with the uh, local soil conservation services, which uh, will conduct a, a survey for us to let us know what will be the plan of action to take care of some of the erosion problem that we have at the, at the Lewis Adams Elementary. However, parents say much more needs to be done. Rotting baseboards and broken water fountains are only two on a long list of complaints. Parents want the $3 million the school systems received from the dog track to make some visible improvements. But Kozman says half of that money has paid salary subsidies for school employees. Another 600000 went to pay off old debts. And with the money left over, the school system is trying to remedy age-old problems. The conditions that we have at these schools have gone have deteriorated over the many past years and it is my charge upon myself to do something about it and parents here are determined to make sure superintendent kozman takes that charge and executes it properly right this is now, lisa walsh wsfa news 12 in macon county The department currently has 127 patrol officers working eight-hour days on a normal three-shift-a-day system. But because of recent computer results showing an increase in crime between 8 p.m. and 2 a.m., Chief Wilson is making a change. The green line indicates when the first shift patrol will come on. They will come on at 6 a.m. in the morning and work till 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The yellow line indicates the second shift patrol, which will come on at 4 p.m. and work till 2 a.m. in the morning. The third shift patrol, which usually comes on at 10.30 at night, will now advance their time by a couple of hours and come on at 8 p.m. at night and work till 6 a.m. in the morning. And this blue line indicates the time period in which you will receive the double coverage.
The new system will mean a 10-hour workday for patrolmen and patrol women of the force. However, their work week will be a four-day on, three-day off setup. We're going to try to meet force with force. This is when the enemy has shown us that they exert the most strength, and that's exactly what we intend to do. Wilson says the new change will come at a minimal cost to taxpayers in the city. In fact, they're only going to need three additional new cars. The change will take place April the 24th. Scott Edcock, WSFA News 12 at the Montgomery Police Department. If it does come up before this court, I'm not supposed to vote on anything and couldn't vote on anything and shouldn't vote on anything unless I'm absolutely objective about it. And it would contain as many as 88 names. And it says, we are solidly, solidly behind you and request that you speak. <laughs> An experienced cab from the professionals. As I'm on the Armed Services Committee, I'll continue to travel as, as past. There's been a, a lot of trickery in what the Soviets have offered and make us look bad if we say, well, we don't agree with that. Uh, but uh, to deny him the right to, to live here for a period of time, I don't uh, if that was part of the quid pro quo to, for a peaceful transition in 